Welcome to Impact the World, a podcast from West Park Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is where we discuss topics related to how we can all love God, love people, and impact the world. Here's your host, Tara Hayes. Hi, I am Tara Hayes, and I'm excited to be sitting down today with one of our global partners, Carmen Hefner. Hey, Carmen. Hey there. I'm excited that you're here. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Carmen has become kind of almost like a sister to me. And yeah. um, so I'm, I'm very happy that you can be here today to sit down and chat with us. For those of you who are uh, maybe new to West Park or just don't know, uh, Carmen has been, we've been supporting Carmen since October of 2019. And if you were at Missions Conference right before the world stopped in 2020, Carmen was at that conference where a lot of people got to meet you and hear um, more about your ministry. But I'm excited to sit down today and hear about where you are now and what's going on and how things are progressing Mm -hmm. and just help people to get to know you um, personally, but also in ministry. So um, if you could just start out by telling us a little bit about maybe how you grew up and your testimony and how you came to Christ, I think that would be great. Okay, great. Um, So I have a bit of a different story from most missionaries that I've known, at least. Um, I didn't come from a Christian home, a Christian background. Um, I, my grandmother was a very strong Christian, but the generation of my parents, my mom and dad, um, both were kind of in um, a generation where they stepped away from the Lord, stepped away Mm -hmm. from the church. And so my influence with regards to church was, first and for- foremost, my grandmother. Um, but secondary was um, a small little country church in Monroe, North Carolina, that had a bus ministry that would pick us up on Sunday mornings. Wow. And I didn't have a, a clear understanding, you know, at age nine of all that was going on in my home and the dynamics there. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background um, my parents um, came from really difficult backgrounds, my dad in particular, and he walked away from the church um, at a very young age, and my mom did the same. And so when she was 14 years old, um, she got pregnant and was forced to give that child up for adoption. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to that, she was a part of the church that is my sending church um, today, First Baptist Church of Matthews. Um, but at 14 years old, when she was forced to give a child up for adoption and um, pushed out of her home and such, mm. um, she just um, step up, took a, a huge step away from the church. So um, my parents were just in a tough place yeah. when they met one another. Uh, my mother had gone through losing a child. Um, she had already gone through a marriage and a divorce mm. by the time she was 20 years old. Wow. And my dad had as well gone through a marriage, a divorce, and had a child from his first marriage. And so they met each other, and they were pretty empty themselves. Yeah. A lot and going on. A lot going on. Yeah. Um, and so they had me, and I <laughs> was brought into the midst of uh, quite a lot of dysfunction. Yeah. Um, my dad was arrested when I was three months old oh. um, for selling um drugs to an undercover cop. And that just kind of began my life. And so I didn't know that there was dysfunction and instability because my grandmother was able to kind of keep that solid rock for us. Um, But definitely there was a lot of that. So my parents, um, I mean, the pastor at at the small little church that had the bus ministry would call me trouble with a capital T. (laughs) Because (laughs) I was one of those bus ministry kids that didn't have parents to sit with. And I think my parents were just like, oh, cool, bus ministry. We can send the kids to church on Sunday and we'll get a little rest and a a little break. Right. So um, I would get on the bus each uh, Sunday. They gave great snacks. Um, (laughs) There you go. There's the plug for good snacks. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And we would uh, get to church and uh, just learn about the Lord, and I had no idea what kind of impact that was making on me at that time. That's when I was around eight, nine years old. 
um, around the same time, my parents split up and uh, my mom left and I stayed with my dad. What I also didn't know at that time, there were drug deals going on outside of my very bedroom door. Wow. Um, my dad was um, doing drugs, but also selling. And there was just a lot going on that way in wow. our home. Um, so the Lord just had his hand on me and was just protecting me in a supernatural way. That's what I was thinking, the protection of God over your life from beginning yes. until now. We'll hear, but that is such an overarching theme. Yes, and I mean, my dad is just a good old boy, right? Mm, right. He grew up in the South hearing about Jesus and uh, came from a background where the church was a part of his family's life. But unfortunately, my parents just got, they were just in that generation of, rebelling against God. And so, um, yeah, the Lord just was protecting me um, all of the time. And so um, in the midst of all of that, um, being with a single father at this point with um, three children that he was raising by himself, the church was coming alongside of my dad without him realizing it, mm. um, still picking us up faithfully every Sunday morning. Wow. And my first stepmother popped into my life around that same time. And so I have a little saying, oh, I don't know where I would be without Jesus and Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, bless Wanda. <laughs> yes. So the church was picking me up on Sunday mornings. Um, I was going to vacation Bible school, uh, you know, d during the summer. And anytime the church bus would show up, we would all, all of us kids would get on the bus. With my dad marrying Wanda, we became a family with five children. Wow. So they were more than happy to send us down the road on Sunday morning. <laughs> um, and it was through the church's uh, faithfulness and ministry that um, during Vacation Bible School, the pastor, you know, again, think small Baptist church out in the country, gave an altar call. Mm. If you leave here today and lightning strikes you dead, <laughs> where would you be, in heaven or in hell? <laughs> right, that's a good <laughs> Southern Baptist, yes. Uh, and I was a rotten child, <laughs> rotten to the core. And so I knew where I would be. Mm. And that was the first time I had been asked that question. And I understood from my time in church and in Sunday school by that point that I needed a Savior. And I ran down to that oh. altar as fast as you can imagine. <laughs> And I believe at that point I did understand um, what I needed with regards to Jesus as my Savior. I don't un I don't think I understood what it meant for um, Jesus to be Lord of my life. Right. Um, so my family continued through many transitions um, from that time. I was nine years old when I accepted Christ, and um, and so by the time I got to high school. That small little Baptist church had not done a ton of discipleship, um, but I had been learning some in Sunday school, and then my stepmom, Wanda, was right there <laughs> leading and guiding and disciplining me um, <laughs> all of the time. And then it was when I was in high school um, in 11th grade that I had a Christian teacher, Miss um, Brooks, Nora Brooks. Um, she had a Bible on her desk. I went to a public high school. Um, she had a Bible on her desk, and we would see her open it each morning Morning during the moment of silence. And we knew that she loved the Lord. She made that very clear to us. And I just had a desire at that time to understand more about God than just what I was getting at church on Sunday morning. So um, my friend Melissa and I, we approached her, and we said, would you mind discipling us after school each day? And she wow. did it. In wow. a public high school. Wow. So she began to disciple uh, Melissa and myself, and she also became the person in our lives that challenged us um, in serving. And she encouraged us to think about doing some mission service through our church. And so uh, Melissa and I started going up to West Virginia um, and Kentucky and to the hollers of the mountains mm. there with an organization called Operation Warm Up, and we would take warm clothes and blankets and jackets and such up into the hollers of the mountains. Wow. And it was during that time um, that the leaders um, of the church began to say, you know, you really seem to have a knack for sharing the gospel, and you seem very caring towards the people up here. 
um, do you, have you thought about doing international missions before? And I was like, no. You mean Kentucky's not international <laughs> missions? <laughs> I know. I mean, I thought, come on, that's another country, right? Learn a new language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so they challenged me about uh, going into missions as far as just like, you know, going on my first international trip um, with a name like Carmen, you know. <laughs> Yes. My family is Southern as Southern can be, and I ended up with this Hispanic name, Carmen. And so I got made fun of a ton with Aww. this name. And so I I just made the statement, I'll go anywhere as long as they don't speak Spanish. Oh. Oops. <laughs> mm. That's a foreshadowing of things to come if you don't know Carmen. <laughs> Oh, so, yes. that's like, don't tell God never. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I uh, resisted Spanish my whole life, like in school, um, middle school. I decided that I would play the trumpet instead of take Spanish. <laughs> and so I joined the band. <laughs> in high school, we were uh, made to, you know, we had to choose a foreign language. So I chose French. So I didn't have to take Spanish. <laughs> And how's your French today, Carmen? <laughs> oh, not so good. <laughs> I can sing you some songs about cheese and bread and stuff, but that's hey. about all I remember. <laughs> and then um, and then in college, uh, we had to choose another language. And I'm like, hey, Hebrew, that sounds like a good language to choose. <laughs> I mean, literally, anything, anything I can do. Anything but Spanish. Exactly. One of the easiest languages to learn. <laughs> so I <Yeah>. choose Hebrew. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, and so um, it was when I was in college, uh, just starting college, that Hurricane Mitch came through um, Central America. And it was during that time, that was in 1998, the end of 98. And so in 1999, the very beginning in January, um, a gentleman from my church called me. His name is Ray. He said, hey, buddy. He <laughs> said, I think you should go on a mission trip down to Nicaragua with me. And I didn't know where Nicaragua was on the map. And you didn't know they spoke Spanish? I hope they didn't speak Spanish, <laughs> but he didn't know either. So he said, I need you to tell your professors you're going to be gone from school for 10 days. Um, I'm going to get you a ticket, and we're going to go to Nicaragua. And so I got on the plane, didn't know where I was going or what was going to happen. <laughs> but the Lord um, saw fit to take me to Nicaragua in January of 1999, and that completely changed my life and my world. Yeah. Well, and that's what I tell people. I think one of the most life-changing things you can do is to take a mission trip. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of benefit and uh, positives about taking trips in the United States. But I think to truly understand <laughs> how, we, how well we have it, mm -hmm. and we have hardship, and there are hard places in the United States— but it will change your worldview completely, completely. And mm. sometimes it's it's a matter of just walking off the plane, yes, to see how different this world is, yes, from where you're living. So I was like 19 years old, almost 20 years old, um, when I went on my first international mission trip. I had traveled overseas prior to that. My the same teacher who had. Um, discipled me. She took us to England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, oh, Germany, Austria, Italy, Switzerland on educational trips. Wow. And so I felt very fortunate um, to have been able to go those places. Um, but I didn't know what was coming until, like you said, I stepped off the plane in Nicaragua. Uh, I didn't know how life-changing that would be for me. Yeah. So would you say that that is kind of the beginning of God calling you to international missions? Absolutely. Yeah. The hurricane had just come through and wiped out. I think there were around 2,000 people who had been killed mm -hmm. during that hurricane. And we were working in the hardest hit area, which was in um, an area of Nicaragua called Chinandega, up by the Honduras border on the west coast of Nicaragua. And um, the children were walking around. Many of them have lo had lost parents oh. in the hurricane. Um, just devastated. little devastated children who had lost everything that was precious to them. But we were there working in the refugee camps um, that were being set up. And I didn't know their language because I had because resisted Because you'd taken Spanish French and Hebrew. My whole life. <laughs> 
Wow. And but these children, um, I was the youngest one on the trip, uh, nineteen, like I said, and these children were gathering around me and holding my hand and walking through the village, mm. and um, they wanted to speak with me. They wanted to communicate, and um, I couldn't communicate with them, and so. They started pointing pointing at farm animals that were everywhere, <laughs> and they would say um, "gringa, gringa." That's you know, You're, white girl, you. white girl. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like American, American, yeah. basically. Um, so um, "gringa, gringa," and they would point to an animal, and there may be a rooster there, huh. and they would say "gallo," and I would repeat "gallo," <laughs> and they would say "ingles, ingles." In English, in English. And so I would say rooster, and they would say rooster. Oh. <laughs> and so we began to find a way to communicate. And it wasn't until we got to the dog, when they pointed to the dog and said, perro, and I tried to get them to say dog, they said dog. <laughs> <laughs> And I They're thought, learning Southern English. Oh, no. I can never do this unless I learn their language. <laughs> and God, in his grace, he has um, just poured um, Spanish into my mm. mind and into my heart, into my every part of my being. And I, the Lord changed my heart on that trip and just gave me a heart for um, Hispanic people and specifically for Nicaragua at that time. But just really broke my heart wow. for um, the Spanish-speaking nations. Yeah. So the thing that you had tried so desperately to avoid the most in your life became very important and heavy on your heart. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So then after that trip, is did you come home and think, okay, that's it, this is— I wasn't fully convinced yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not always in one trip. I mean, you know, there's it's a process. <laughs> yes, I was 19. I was excited. Yeah. Uh, my biggest change at that point was I've got to learn Spanish, and I've got to learn it right now. Um, and so I, I began to search for opportunities. Um, that I think I was in my sophomore year of college. I began to search for opportunities to be able to serve more in Nicaragua. So I spent my first summer in Nicaragua in twenty in uh, two thousand. Wow! And it was during that time that was a big, huge um, change for me to um, go and spend my entire summer away from home. I'd never really been away from home. Like yeah. Christopher Columbus dropped my family off in Matthews, North Carolina, and, <laughs> and no one's ever <laughs> left. <laughs> we that's where we settled, and that's where we're gonna stay. Yes. <laughs> So I looked at my plane ticket. I had three months that I was going to be in Nicaragua, and I just cried and cried. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I knew that's what God had called me to do, so I persevered. I stuck it out. I didn't go home. Um, and the Lord, during that time, uh, also had me sharing a room with a Guatemalan lady who did not speak any English oh. whatsoever. And So, so you're going to learn uh, it by immersion, basically. Yes. <laughs> So we communicated with just hand gestures, hand gestures, <laughs> yes. And then I saw her reading her Bible in Spanish, and I was reading my Bible in English, and I thought, you know, we have that in common. Yeah. And so with, with a translator, I asked her if she would please consider teaching me Spanish. So we started with Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a good place it to start. It was a good place to start. <laughs> the little puedo en Cristo que me fortalece. And then from there, she began to help me read and began to help me pray. And God just opened my heart wow. um, completely. And I've never actually studied um, Spanish in the formal setting. Um, God literally just gave it to me. Wow. It was and, a beautiful thing. And for those of you that are listening, if you ever uh, have the opportunity to be around Carmen or near Carmen when she's speaking with someone in Spanish, she's, you sound like a native speaker. I mean, it literally is a gift from God that he has just enabled you to to speak Spanish so Absolutely. fluently. Yeah, it is a, it's a gift, it, it, and it's from him. Yeah. Wow. Well, he was setting you up for ministry. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't give us things so that we can just say, look, this is really cool. I mean, you know, he he has a purpose, and Even that this, has 
you know, as much as you fought it. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gave it to you, so then he had a purpose for it. Even this Hispanic first name that I ended up with. <laughs> now the Hispanic people, when I introduce myself, hi, my name's Carmen. They're like, no, but what's your no, real really, name? No, really, what's your American name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm no, like, no, really. look. It's really look Carmen. At my passport, Carmen. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's how I uh, got into ministry. And then, like, as far as international uh, travels and stuff yeah. with mission trips, but it was after that summer of being there for three months. Um, it was October of, of 2000 that I was reading through God's Word, and I came across the passage where um, Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler, and the disciples are there present. And um, it begins to go through where they've said, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus is like, yeah, well, so... To follow me, you need to leave lands and home and mothers family. and fathers and yeah. family and all those things. And uh, I'm just paraphrasing that yeah. right now. Um, it's the Carmen version. <laughs> but as I read that passage there as a 20-year-old, I was like, Lord, yes, I'll follow you. Mm -hmm. I'll go wherever. And I was ready to go right then and there. But my pastor was like, um, no, you need to finish college. <laughs> Well, very wise on his part. <laughs> you should probably go to seminary. <laughs> so I did that as well. And it wasn't until, um, let's see, I finished seminary in 2003. Um, it wasn't until 2005 that I felt like the Lord was fully releasing me to go onto the field. Wow. Yeah. So so you did. You ended up in Nicaragua. I did. <laughs> Against I did. your young self. Um, your dreams were not of Nicaragua. No. But um, so then how long were you there? And uh, how, how how does that transition to where you are now? Because you're not in Nicaragua now. I'm not. But yeah. God used that to get you to where you are now. Right. So it was um, it was with that first step into Nicaragua, like living there Um that I really began to, well, let's see. Let's go back like this. I had a seminary professor. Um, she's Cuban, and she was mentoring me during seminary. And she knew that I was going to be applying to go out with um, ABWE. Um, and so I, I was actually, I was with a different ministry in Nicaragua for 2005, 2006. And then I heard about ABWE in 2007. And so um, I was going up to candidate seminar. And for those of you that don't know what candidate seminar looks like, it's now called NEMO, N-E-M-O. But basically, you go in and you're presented with all the options. Like, we need you here. You could right. do this in this country and this You basically and go and people fight over you. <laughs> yeah. Please. Well, and that's uh -huh. just because the laborers are few, let's be yes. honest. And there are so many countries that need people to come and share the gospel. Yes. But it is, you do feel a little of that, oh, I I mean, literally all over the world. They're like, please, come here, come here. Yes. Yeah. So I was getting ready to leave for a candidate seminar um, in 2007. And my mentor at the time, she said, Carmen, I hear you saying that you are you want to serve the Lord. and But I hear it come across this way. Lord, I'll serve you. Um, I'll serve you anywhere as long as it's Nicaragua. Mm. So this is 2007. And, and so I heard what she said, but, but she said, when you go to this candidate seminar, I want you to go with an open heart and an open mind for what the Lord may show you there. And she said, I, I think you should ask God to break your heart for the nations. Mm. And I heard her, but, and I did pray. But I was That's like, a Lord, big burden, please. Though. But I, I want to go to Nicaragua. <laughs> and <Thanks>. so <laughs> I ended up at Candidate Seminar. We heard from all the different regions and all the needs that were presented. And my heart was breaking for the nations by the time we ended mm -hmm. that, that time period. And then they asked us to just take some time and pray about where the Lord would have us go. And... Uh, it was an odd thing. We I walked outside at the home office in Harrisburg, um, Pennsylvania, and there's always two flags flying at the home office. And um, one of them, I believe, is the 
uh, let's say the Canadian flag, maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> and then there's always um, a different flag left. I think think it's each week for a different country that they're praying for. And I walked outside and I saw blue and white and blue. I was like, well, those are the colors of the Nicaraguan flag. But the, I know there's other countries that have blue, white, blue. And as I got <laughs> close to it, it was the Nicaraguan flag. Aww. So I ran into the home office and I talked to the president of ABWE at that time, Michael Loftus. And I said, Dr. Loftus, that the Nicaraguan flag is flying. And I've been praying if, if God would let me go to Nicaragua. <laughs> You know, I'm like, it's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> the Lord gave me a special sign <laughs> in the form of a flag. <laughs> and Michael Loftus said at that time, you know, the flags only rotate about every seven years. And so this flag has not flown in a very long time. Mm. And he said, I'm not saying that's a sign from the Lord, but <laughs> yep, that's the Nicaragua flag. <laughs> so I then ran to my regional director. Um, And I said, I I think I really am supposed to go to Nicaragua. If that is a possibility for me, I would like to go. And so they said, yep, you can. We would love to have you on the on the Nicaragua team. Wow. So, yeah. So you did. What year did you get to Nicaragua? Uh, So with ABWE, um, I got there in 2009. Right. So I was raising support for about two years. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, ministry in Nicaragua was mostly with children. Am I correct? Um, children, and also we have a church planning institute okay. there, That's what I and thought. so um, I was working with the church planners' wives, yes. um, doing theological education and ministry training. Yeah, yeah. So that was um, fourteen years. Um, so all together, yes, w- with the other ministry plus with ABWE, fourteen. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm, I'm figuring once you got to Nicaragua, you're like, well, I'm here for the rest of my life. Oh, absolutely. I <laughs> never, I mean, that was my plan, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Right. All and included Nicaragua. Yes, because I was clear that I had read that in the Bible. Right. Like, follow me to Nicaragua. And there was that whole flag thing. The flag thing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That God was so gracious in the midst of my... <laughs> Isn't God patient with us? <laughs> He's so patient. Yeah. But I do believe he grew me up in Nicaragua um, in ministry right. um, so that I could now be with the part of ABWE that I'm with, right. which is Live Global. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were very specific things that you needed to learn and be a part of and experience in Nicaragua. Absolutely. Um, as your first you know, track or foray, as you might say, into international missions. Yes. So um, tell a little bit about at what point where you thought, I might not be in Nicaragua for the rest of my life. What is going on here? Yeah, it was a uh, earth-shattering moment for me. (laughs) That pretty uh, traumatic. Gary and Marty Crawford got to be a part of. Right. (laughs) For those of you um, who are familiar, Gary and Marty Crawford are members of our church. But they're also part of uh, at ABWE Live Global, and so yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Gary and Marty were my regional administrators at the time. Um, but just a little bit of a backstory there. I didn't realize that the team on the ground in Nicaragua had been planned had been, had been started with basically a DNA of working with national partners. Mm. Um, they they had already been um, touched by GAP, which was right. Global Access Partnerships that is now Live Global, um, prior to me ever coming on the field. So I had no idea that when I stepped on the field in Nicaragua, there was already the DNA there right. of working with national partners. So my only understanding of ministry for the entire time I was in Nicaragua was the missionary takes a step back and you empower the national partners. Right. Because the the ultimate goal is the Lord is allowing us to be here to work with you, to help you plan a church or start some sort of ministry. But the goal is always to hand that to them. Yes. Because that is their heart language, their people, their, Mm -hmm. and that God has equipped them special in a way that we'll never be equipped. Right. To work amongst their own people for the gospel. 
And we never know how long we can actually be in country. There's right. just things that are happening around the world. Um, COVID is a great example <laughs> yeah. of when missionaries get pulled off the field. Um, you know, some people were able to stay, but some missionaries were pulled off the field during that time. And um, so, yeah, I I was uh, the thing that probably I think struck me the most that began this uh what I would call almost a discontentment um, within me was that we were working with nationals in Nicaragua. We had the Church Planners Institute. Um, the pastors were being trained, and they were being prepared for ministry, but the women felt like they were not. Mm. And so they asked for training. I came alongside of them along with all of my uh, ABWE uh, team, and we began to train the women for ministry. And then as a part of that, we had a church plant uh, behind a very active volcano, the Messiah Volcano, that asked <laughs> us, uh, the three of us single girls um, who were on the field with ABWE, if we would come alongside of them and help them with their children's ministry and their women's ministry. So we stepped into that uh, position, and we did something that we shouldn't have done. We walked in there knowing that we we should work with nationals, mm. but there were three of us, and we could get a lot done, and we forgot to include the nationals in the equation mm. when we were working with the children's ministry there. And so the three of us single girls would go home each Christmas. We would usually leave uh, before Thanksgiving, and we would be gone November, December, and January, so not your traditional furlough. Right. We would come home for those three months, and that would equal up to a year, over four years. And so um, what we realized is we were not leaving anyone trained. Right. And in There was place. no one to take the pl- to, to work that ministry. Yeah. We had created a dependency, mm. um, which sometimes happens, you know, yeah. with ministry and missions. And um, we had created a dependency there, and— we had no one to teach the Sunday school class for the three months that we were gone. Mm. And so it was during that time that I thought, we're we're not doing this right. Mm. And I don't know why that in particular, in particularly uh, caused this kind of discontentment in me, um, but it did because I was frustrated um, that the national had been cut out of the picture. Yeah. And I didn't know that at the time. I just knew something's Something's off. not right. Yeah. 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 So it was then, um, let's see, uh, Easter of 2017, um, we had had a team on the ground. I was exhausted. Um, we were leading a team um, from North Carolina. We finished up that week of leading the team, and I was so tired, and Gary and Marty had come down to just check on all of us missionaries and see how we were doing. And they said, Carmen, we were uh, just wondering, you know, how what you're up to, how you're doing, everything. And I was driving in the car they were riding with me and uh, headed back. Just say, let me pull over for a minute so I can uh, cry. <laughs> I just kept talking and crying. And Gary's like, do you want to stop for ice cream or something? <laughs> Um, but he uh, he asked me, and the tears just came, and I said, I don't know what God's doing. I don't understand, but there is, there's been a change in my heart, and I don't know where it's coming from. And um, so they talked me um, through all of that and spent time with me, um, and they said, you know, this could just be a reset button that God is, you know, is giving you. You may be experiencing a little bit of burnout. Um, but you just need to take time just to be in God's Word. And so they challenged me to do that during the Holy Week there in Nicaragua, Mm -hmm. um, Easter week. And I did. I got in God's Word, and I was trying to figure it out. Lord, what are you doing here? What is this discontentment that I'm feeling? I thought that I was supposed to be in Nicaragua for the rest of my life. Do I need to call all my supporters and just tell them, Okay, I'm done. It's over. I don't know what I'm going to do. But. It all feels very dramatic in that moment, doesn't it? it because it's so overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things Gary and Marty had thrown out to me during that uh, that conversation, they said, you know, it could be that God's calling you to a different field. What? I was like, no No. Way. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? People do that? Yeah. <laughs> People change? 
That wasn't I was like, my plan. <laughs> no, God called me to Nicaragua. And I said yes. And I was obedient. And I did it. And um, they're like, well, I mean, it could be any of these things. You could be experiencing a little bit of burnout. Uh, you may need to hit the reset button there. Um, God may be changing your direction, which I was not willing to accept. Um, but they didn't give me an answer. They just uh-huh. asked me to just get in God's word and just pray. And so I did, and eventually during that time of just prayer and uh, being in the Word, I went back to my calling. Mm -hmm. So I went back to that passage that I referred to earlier um, where Jesus is speaking to the rich young rulers and telling his disciples what you have to leave to follow him. And I could have sworn it said to follow me to Nicaragua. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) As I, I want went. to know what version that is. Because <laughs> I've never been to Nicaragua, and I've read that passage a lot. <laughs> and so as I went back and read that passage, um, the Lord made it clear to me, I called you to follow me. I didn't mm. even tell you where. I just called you to follow me. So I contacted um, Gary and Marty again. My heart was also going back to my mentor from Cuba, my Cuban mentor that was my seminary professor, who was who had said, Carmen, I hear you saying, Lord, I'll go anywhere as long as it's Nicaragua. And I remembered her challenging me for the Lord to break my heart for the nations. Mm. So Gary and Marty, Marty, in their wisdom, were able to help me put all of that together and to realize that I had grown up ministerially in Nicaragua, and I was equipped for ministry, but I had asked the Lord to break my heart for the nations. And so Gary and Marty said, hey, do you remember being presented with GAP when you were in Candidate Seminar? Do you remember George Collins? And I was like, do I remember George Collins? <laughs> if you meet George Collins once, you remember him forever. He's unforgettable. That's that right. Voice, that, that voice. That booming right. voice. I was like, yes, I remember George Collins, but I only remember him from Candidate Seminar. And they said, well, you know, have you considered GAP? And I'm like, I don't even know, like, what? I remember George, but I don't remember what that is. <laughs> and so um, they said, why don't you give George Collins a call? And so George uh, and I had a conversation, and um, he was basically like, if Gary, and, if Gary and Marty are seeing that you could be a possible person to work with Gap, we would like to have a conversation with you mm-hmm. because – Gap is not for everyone. Um, Working with nationals around the world, um, that is not for everyone. That's a a, a, a different type of ministry for most. And so um, he said, I'd like to to meet with you. I'd like to have a conversation. And so I packed up my bags, and uh, I moved home in September of, um, what year was that? 2017. Wow. Didn't know where I was going. Sold all my earthly possessions. Did yet you again. feel like um, Abraham when he says, "I'm going to take you to a place, but I'm not going to tell you where"? I did. So just follow me. Yeah, I actually wrote that in an email to a supporting church, <laughs> and they're like, "We will no longer be supporting <laughs> you." Oh, <laughs> that was heartbreaking. That for is me heartbreaking because I did have people saying, "Oh, if you go home, you're going to lose all your support." And so I actually wrote those words in an email. I feel like Abraham right now, Mm. and I know that I have to be obedient to this. And it is not my idea to leave Nicaragua. Clearly, the Lord is up to something. Right. And I just have to be obedient. And I was. Wow. Yeah. And I did lose that support. But (laughs) But, but I knew that I had to, to obey. Yeah. Well, because to not obey... It's going to be worse than losing that support. Absolutely. And talk about miserable and, I mean, fighting against what God has for you. Because since Nicaragua and joining what is now Live Global, right? I mean, I know a lot of your story, and it's just exciting to sit and think about all of these little pieces from the time that you were a child have all come together Absolutely. to make this... To help mold you and form you into the person that God had you for this ministry. Yes. Where you are now. So let's talk a little bit about, so jump way ahead. So you've you've left Nicaragua. Yeah. You've, okay, the Lord's leading me to 
to go somewhere. I don't know what yeah. that looks like. And so then what happened after that? Yeah, and, and part of not knowing where I was going to go is also where do I go in the U.S.? I mean, <laughs> I've told you all at this point, I come from a highly dysfunctional family, a lot of drugs and al- alcohol. Uh, my, my parents were married and divorced four times apiece. Wow. Um, my dad at this point had passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, did, I didn't know where to go. And so um, God also in his grace and mercy had sent down, sent down a team to Nicaragua a year prior to me coming home. And um, there was a lady on the team, um, Janet Patterson, sure. who um, she was asking me some hard mama-like <laughs> questions. <laughs> and Don't you love when you meet somebody, you've never met them before, <laughs> yeah. but there's that instant connection yes. and they are clearly sent by God just for you. Absolutely. So I, I, you know, I answered her hard questions and uh, <laughs> I showed her where I was living in Nicaragua, all of that. Um, and she said, you know, if you're ever in Tennessee um, when you're in the States or if you're ever in the States and you want to come to Tennessee, I'd really love for my family to meet you. I'd love for you to come to Nashville. And I've never been to Nashville. Oh, and Sounds <laughs> fancy, doesn't it? Yeah. Nashville. And being from North Carolina, I'm like, oh, over there in the mountains. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> That's what Tennessee is. (laughs) Yes, the whole state. Uh (laughs) So, yeah, it was uh, fall of 2016. I came home on my little furlough, the November, December, January time that the singles would come home. And um, holidays are always tense for my biological family. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to take her up on this. I'm just going to call and see if I can go to Nashville. And so um, I made the trek across from uh, (laughs) North Carolina to Nashville and just walked into their home, and I was immediately mm. embraced um, by their entire family. Not just her immediate family, but her entire extended family of 30-plus people. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm not used to that many people in a family. <laughs> and they just welcomed me in with open arms, and I had no idea at that point. I mean, we're talking November before I left in September the following year, I had no idea what the Lord was providing yeah. and what the Lord was doing there. But after I met her family, she said, Carmen, if the Lord were to ever call you home, we just want you to know that you have a place to land. Because she knew my testimony, and she knew that that was going to be an issue for me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, thanks, but I'll be in Nicaragua for the rest of my life, and <laughs> I will see you when Remember, I see you. Remember, God called me to Nicaragua <laughs> forever. Plan on me being here for Thanksgiving next year, but... (laughs) I'll see you every year from (laughs) November till January. Exactly. That was the plan. And uh, so when I began feeling the Lord uh, working in my heart towards taking steps away from Nicaragua, which was earth shattering to me, um, I reached out to Janet and I said, are you like for real? Like what you said? And she was like, oh, absolutely. For real. And... um, so I had no idea what the Lord had for me just in Tennessee alone. Yeah. He's provided um, a family for me, something I'd never had um, that felt yeah. like a safe place. So, But it has provided for me a launch pad to the world. Yeah. So the Lord in Nashville has given me a support system beyond what I could have ever imagined. And, um, and I'm only two hours and 20 minutes from West Park as well. (laughs) So, you know, that's why we claim you as ours. Yes. Too. (laughs) And so um, they have uh, definitely given me some kind of crazy rooted and grounded feeling that allows me to launch out all over the world to literally places I've never been and cultures I've never experienced. And knowing that I have a place to come back to um, and call home and be filled up there yeah. and then go back out and give. So well, it's a, it's been a really beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing. relationship. Yeah. Um, I almost, Janet's here today. I almost forced her to be on the podcast <laughs> with us, but I spared uh-huh. her because she looked at me like, I will hurt you if you put me in front of a microphone. But um, you can't move forward without just, thinking about the provision of, I mean, you're going through a very traumatic period in your ministry where everything 
first of all, that you fought against. Yes. And then the Lord gave you such a burden yes. for. And now you see that coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And you think, I mean, that's upheaval. It was and, really hard. And to know that you had that safe place, soft place to land. Oh, yeah. And yeah. that God provided you that family. Yeah. And to think about his timing, I mean, Janet coming down on a trip and having mm-hmm. a conversation. And, you know, just think back on so many things that you've already talked about in your life about your grandmother and this mm-hmm. church with the bus ministry and then your mentor in high school and your mentor in seminary. None of these, all these things alone look impressive or they're great pieces to your story, but none of that has been wasted when you put Not that together. All. And it's it's just an amazing picture of God's grace and mercy. Oh, I love it so much. It has literally taken a village to get me here today. <laughs> um, but, and, and I will say, as a part of that village, like my own biological family, with all of its dysfunction, um, equipped me so much for ministry. I mean, I've had to go through, you know, a ton of counseling and working through forgiveness and dealing with family stuff as well. But it has given me um, just tools for ministry that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else. Well, it gives you realistic eyes for the world. Right. Because I feel like sometimes um, it's easy for us inside the church to speak church talk and you know, look at everything w- with church glasses. Yes. <laughs> and um, you know the reality of what mm. it's like to grow up in a home void yes. of Jesus. Absolutely. And and um, it's given But it's me... a beautiful picture of nothing is a lost cause, and God mm. can use anyone in any way that he chooses. Absolutely. It's given me such a greater and deeper um, understanding of grace. Yes. Than anything that I could have learned anywhere else. It's right. just, um, it's been a beautiful, a it's beautiful a thing. It's hard, but it's a beautiful story. Yeah. Like people ask me about my experience in seminary, and I tell them, you know, seminary was one of the darkest times for me, it was mm. one of the hardest times of my life because I understood how to be light in darkness. Mm. Like, I had been raised in darkness. I knew that my dad put away all of his drugs when he saw me coming down the driveway. I knew how to be light in that darkness. Um, I mean, my my brothers all ended up in the drug business with my dad. Mm. The, you know, middle schoolers selling to middle schoolers and high schoolers. Wow. And, and the Lord um, both protected me within my home life, but he also um, taught me a lot. But seminary was difficult because that was the first time I had been in a Christian environment. And I said, um, seminary was hard because I know how to be light and darkness, but I didn't know how to be a light in the box of light bulbs. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm grateful for my biological family in the sense that, yeah, I, I learned so much about grace. Um, just being able to be with them so much about forgiveness um, as well. And so, well, they yeah. set you up for ministry, but not in a way. I mean, they would yeah. have never thought we're going to prepare <laughs> Carmen for ministry. Exactly. But that they did. They totally did. Yeah. And so, you know, it reminds me of that um, be thankful in all things. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you can be thankful for that, you know, in that situation. I mean, would you prefer that your parents had this idyllic marriage and loved Jesus and, you know, whatever? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you can be thankful for how that did prepare you for where you are now. Right, right. So, Because a lot of the people that I work with in ministry have messy past and me- messy backgrounds, too. Yeah. So to be able to say, oh, I've been there, I've done that, I've walked through that, or my parents have walked through that, and I was the child that yeah. had to watch that. That equipped me in a way that nothing else could. Yeah. But at the same time, to now be part of a loving family, a safe place, yeah. a healthy family, um, I also recognize how beautiful it is when a missionary is able to be launched out into the world from a Christian home. Right. Um, because you truly have that rooted groundedness. 
the that foundation. you know you can always come back to if anything yeah. goes wrong in life. Yeah. So it's wow. been really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, currently in Live Global, yeah. for several years now, you've been mostly working with training people mm-hmm. to reach out to children. Yes. And I have. so talk just a little bit about that. Sure. So when I started with Live Global in 2017, um, I just had to try to look around and see what is this and how is it different from what I've been doing and what is my niche? Where am I going to fit within Live Global? Um, and that was a, uh, a bit of a challenge, trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing. Um, but I was approached by um, a couple of Live Global missionaries um, about doing some children's training. And the reason they approached me is because I was using their materials um, in Nicaragua. So I had been doing this very same training in, in church plants in Nicaragua and teaching the women, um, the church planners' wives and children's ministers in Nicaragua how to use the material. So the couple that wrote the material, it's called 99 Adventures, and um, that was written by Jim Cook and mm-hmm. his wife Susan. They go and do trainings all over the world. And they said, hey, Carmen, you, you did this in Nicaragua. Do you think you could travel the world with us and, and do this? And I'm like, hey, uh, let's try it out. Let's try it. <laughs> Sounds like a good uh, plan. So uh, I had originally committed to going out with them for um, the first year just to see what their method was and how they were doing ministry. Um, and then COVID hit. Oh. Yeah. Wah, wah. <laughs> so uh, yes. we were supposed to have been in many countries in right. 2020, and every trip kept getting canceled. Every, yeah. So the I only, remember that. Yeah. I mean, you were at missions conference, yes. and things were getting like st- already starting to kind of be very questionable. Yeah, yeah. Because it was about uh, missions conference was the end of February, first week of March. And, exactly. And within two weeks, even we were not having in-person services. Right. Much less sending people all over the world. Yeah, I left a missions conference, I think on like March the 1st, I got to Nashville and we had a massive tornado that night. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about the tornado. And then we all started working uh, to clean up from the tornado and people were coughing and coughing and they're like, what's this? And all of a sudden we realized that COVID was hitting. And then, uh, yeah. Then the world just changed. It did. It yeah. completely changed. So, um, but since then, you have been traveling the world, literally, yeah. and training um, people to use the 99 Adventures. I have. Which is yeah. exciting. So, tell people <laughs> um, Carmen is so, 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 so busy. And um, I don't know how many frequent flyer miles you must have, <laughs> but give everybody just a rundown of. Like just this year in 2022, because things have started to open back up mm-hmm. and it's been a little bit easier for you to travel this year, right. even than last year. So just kind of give us a rundown of where all you've been this year. Yeah. Okay. So, um, wow. Where to start? Uh, we started in Chile, um, South America. Uh, well, let me let me just back up just sure. a, a smidge. We went to... In 2018, we went to Cuba for the first um, 99 Adventures training, yes. and we trained in two different areas of Cuba. And our main contact there, who's now become a Live Global partner, her name is Rode. And Rode, um, she is a Cuban seminary professor who started the children's minister curriculum for the seminary. She's in an amazing Cuba. woman. So any children's minister that comes out of Cuba has been trained under her. That's awesome. And so um, she has access to like 600 churches um, just within the Baptist churches of Cuba. And so we went down, we trained for two weeks with her in 2018. She shared as part of her testimony that the Lord had called her to be a missionary, um, not only to her country, but to other countries around the world. And so we had, we decided we want to make this possible for you. We want yeah, because she had never been anywhere. Us. Right. Right. And so in 2019, we were supposed to, excuse me, 2020, we were supposed to go down and train with her. That was our first trip for 2020 was going to be Cuba, but COVID, mm-hmm. right? 
So we had already sent down the funds for all of the printing, for the food, for the lodging, for all of the uh, participants for two weeks worth of training in Cuba. And our visas were denied because of COVID. Because of COVID. And so um, Rode called me from Cuba and said, what do I do? If y'all aren't coming, what do I do? Because I have all these people scheduled. I have the food purchased. I've done all of the printing. What do I do? Because they were printing the books and the materials on site. And you were basically showing up to yes. do the training. Yeah, we're not able to take curriculum into Cuba. Right. And, and so that's they always actually, a little sketchy about what you can take into Cuba. Yeah, <laughs> she had to find like a underground printing On the DL. press to get yep. the books printed. And so um, so she was ready to go. And I said, Rode, we're not coming. Do you think you could get together your own training team, train them, and Y'all train, do these trainings by yourself for the next two weeks. And she was shaking in her boots. And I'm like, you can do this. And so <laughs> we worked together through WhatsApp for two solid weeks. Um, there with, are some good things about technology. Yes, yes. <laughs> and COVID had not hit Cuba yet mm. at that moment. I mean, they're an island, right? So right. They, it had not hit um, during those two weeks. And so she was able to train up a team of Cubans that came along alongside of her and did the training. And they trained, I think, around 80 churches that week um, for children's ministry. Wow. And she was able to give them two years of Sunday school curriculum. I mean, what a wealth of resources. Yes. Yeah. But with wow. that said, uh, that started her on a path of, I can do this training without y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need Carmen. <laughs> and it also, um, you know, like I said, she felt called into mission. Yeah. And so when travel started opening back up, which for us uh, was closer to 2021, 2022, the end of 2021, we went to C- Cuba. Right. And we said, you know, Rode, you said that you feel like the Lord is calling you to be a missionary to the world, like to your country and to the world. Would you be willing to travel down and train with us in Chile? So, you know Julio Fredes, yes, Liliana? Yes, yes. More of our partners. Uh, yes. So Julio Fredes and Liliana work a lot in Cuba, and they have a, su- a really sweet relationship with Rode. And so um, she said, I would love to go, and can I go and see Julio and Lili- Liliana while <laughs> yes, we're there? Yes, So we have a team of ABWE missionaries on the ground in Chile, they work at the seminary in mm-hmm. Santiago, and they set up a training for us. We were able to get Rode on her first like international ministry trip. Is that the first time she's left Cuba ever? It's not the first time. Okay. She she has worked with um, CEF Press, Child Evangelism Fellowship, Okay, and she's done some trainings outside of Cuba with okay. that. She's been here to the state. She's been to Knoxville, to Nashville, to Kentucky, Na- Kentucky. North Carolina, um, but but it was her first like international ministry mission. trip yeah. where she was actually ministering to others and not going for a training um or not going for support raising. Yeah. And so And um, she's been dreaming of that her whole oh, life since she was 9 years old and yeah. she's getting ready to turn 60. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she went to to Chile and clearly she didn't need us there, but we were there <laughs> and we got to watch her yeah as a seminary professor, train in her own language. Wow. And um, and so we trained, I don't remember how many people there. And then um, then I flew from um, Chile up through England and then England to Egypt. And so um, Jeff and Julie Sanders, right. um, they I reached out to them in November of 2021, and I said, I need more Live Global Missionaries in my life because I want to understand how you're doing partnership ministry. I want to just be able to sit back and watch this. And I want to learn from you. And Jeff and Julie being the teachers that they are. Right. And that wealth of knowledge that they have and their openness to allow others to come alongside of them. They invited me to go to Egypt. Nice. (coughs) Now, remember, at this point, I've not done a lot of travel outside of, outside of um, Latin America for ministry. I understand Spanish, and I understand Hispanic culture, but 
I had never thought about going to a Muslim country before, That's even totally though it's a different. soft Muslim right. country. I'd never thought about going there before. And so Jeff and Julie reached out. They're like, do you want to go? I'm like, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> of course I want to go. <laughs> I had no idea what I was signing up for. But <laughs> yes. So I was able to travel with them um, in April of 2022. Um, and that was amazing. Yeah. And that trip really changed my perspective on so many things, including the the children's ministry training. Yeah, they were able to speak into my life during that time and say, Carmen, all of the tools that you gathered through your years in Nicaragua have really prepared you to develop partnerships, to develop partners around the world, and not just in Latin America. Yeah. And so although you can do children's ministry training, and when those opportunities arise, we think that's you know great, but um, you have some other gifts and abilities that we would like to tap into, <coughs> and we would like for you to um, begin considering um, developing partners for Live Global. Wow. Yeah. So that's a whole, I'm, that had to be exciting, yeah. but also a little like, what? I was like, you think I can do this? You really think, <laughs> you think so? I can do this? I'm like, as long as y'all like hang out by my side and <laughs> help me walk through this. And they're good at that. They are. They're really good at that. So they challenged me in that. And uh, Julie and I sat down uh, a couple months later and worked through a plan for me to go to Europe and to be able to go and visit some partners who had not had some visits or to be able to um, meet new partners. And so... Um, I was able to travel to Romania, and we met with some of our partners there who are working specifically with uh, the Ukrainian refugees mm-hmm. who are flowing over the right. Romanian border. So, <coughs> so you've <laughs> so started the beginning of the year. So now we're sitting at the end of 2022. Yes, and you've been. So we ministry wise, it it was uh, Chile and then Egypt, and then Romania, and then Spain. I was in Alicante, Spain, with our partners there. Rode, my Cuban partner, mm-hmm. met us in Spain. So she had, at this point she's been to Chile and was training. She went to Spain to meet partners. So she got to walk alongside of me as a ministry partner, meeting Live partners. Global Partners. Wow. That was amazing. Um, and then after Spain, she was able to then travel with me to Nicaragua. And we did a training there. We um, we trained 40 Nicaraguans. And as a part of that training, we took 10 of the Nicaraguans to be the trainers the second week of training. And they trained, and they trained 40 more right. Nicaraguans. So that's 80 churches in Nicaragua. Multiplication. Yeah, yeah. We like that. We like multiplication. Yes. And, of course, then at that point, Rode had met an ABWE team in Chile. She had met Live Global Partners in Spain. And then in Nicaragua, she got to meet our ABWE team on the ground and our Live Global Partners that are in Nicaragua. Wow. And that's when she looked at me and she said, I'm a part of something much bigger than I thought. And <laughs> she just cried. And yeah. so, um, it's and we been, could do a whole episode beautiful. of that trip. Yeah. And how totally. you, <laughs> totally. the difficulties of getting there. I mean, we could do a whole episode just about Cuba and yeah. what God's doing there. Absolutely. And what it takes for you to get there. Oh, it's crazy. And for Rode to minister <laughs> and just what's going on there. But yeah. Anyway, so, so after that. After that, I finished in Nicaragua and then I met Jeff and Julie yeah. um, back over in um, in the Middle East. And we got a chance to travel to a couple of countries there. And we were able to uh, do some training and do encouraging, like a ministry of encouragement yeah. to some of our partners who are in. Uh, really difficult countries. Yeah. And then we needed a chance to debrief our Middle Eastern yeah. trips. You know, our, Those are hard trips. Yeah. Very hard trips. So we decided to run over to Greece for a couple of days. And As I you finally should. And finally got to meet <laughs> Stephanie. Stephanie yeah. is one of our very own homegrown 
global partners. And everyone's been telling me for years, you got to meet Stephanie. Have you met Stephanie? Do you know Stephanie? Do <laughs> you, you happen to know, to know Steph Stephanie? And I didn't understand what that meant until I sat down at the table with her for dinner <laughs> and I just listened and I was like, oh my word, I feel like I just ate supper with myself. <laughs> we have so many words, Stephanie yep. and I. <laughs> yep. As you should. As you should. I love so, Stephanie. We just had a time of being able to debrief in Greece, and then uh, I just returned from there, and I leave this Monday for Cuba. For Cuba. And Cuba will be my last trip of the year. Well. <laughs> so I lost So count. we are in December. <laughs> And I think, you know, I don't know how you could fit another one in after no, Cuba. No, <laughs> Well, you need to rest. Yes. You need to rest. Yeah. But uh, it's just exciting to watch the um, kind of the transformation of, you know, where you were, where God's taking you, and just to hear about all the different – I mean, we literally could talk for hours and hours and hours. I mean, we've been talking for a while, but um, – <laughs> Just about what each one of these trips means as far as preparation and who mm. you're going to work with and what you're going to take. Because when you go on these trips to visit these partners, a lot of times it is – a big part of it is to encourage the partner. Absolutely. And they need things. They need, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of preparation and what are you going to take and – what are we going to, how are we going to bless them and how are we going to serve them? You know, and so it's, um, it's, it's a different kind of ministry than going and knowing you're going to train people mm -hmm. um, to just, you know, that's just kind of one aspect now right. of what you're doing. Right. But, and they're able to come alongside of us now and say, this is what we, we need. need. So, what I'm learning, like with Jeff and Julie, and something that I find that's incredibly unique. Um, is they are truly letting the partner lead and they're asking, what do you need and how can we come alongside of you in right. ministry? And so if that, if that means a training resource, they tell Jeff and Julie what they need and Jeff and Julie are literally developing curriculum yes. specifically for those partners. And so, um, yeah, I'm just in a learning stage with them and going, wow. Yeah. Um, and I just feel it's just a, such a privilege to come alongside of them and uh, to be able to learn. Well, I think what's exciting about this, um, it, it helps people to understand how the face of missions and working with global partners and uh, national partners is changing. Tremendously. It's no longer um, we send somebody – they stay there their whole life. They, you know, they have a church. They would just work in that church. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. missions has changed drastically, mm -hmm. not only in the way that we send people to other countries, but now the nations truly are coming to us. And um, absolutely. so it's just, it's really exciting to watch the way that, that God is working all of these things together right? Um, to spread the gospel and... I really appreciate you sitting down and talking with me today. Oh, thank you so much for um, allowing me to share. Yeah. I know there's a lot more we could probably talk about, but um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you to hear about your ministry or to, you know, maybe, I don't know if you send out like a, a prayer letter, news, you know, mm -hmm. email, what would be the best way for people to get in touch with you? Um. So... We I do have uh, a a page on the Live Global, um, like connected to Live Global. I'm trying to grab all the letters <laughs> here. Um, Should have told you that. Ahead of time. <laughs> That's my fault. And so uh, there is a website where you can reach out. Um, so it's um, https okay um, colon backslash blacks backslash support dot live global dot org backslash Carmen um, also um, through email my live global um, email address is Carmen dot Hefner and my last name is H E F F N E R so Carmen.Hefner at liveglobal.org. 
Okay. And I um, will put all this in the show notes. Okay. And um and I do have a closed Facebook group. Okay. And that is going to be probably the best place to just kind of understand what is going on what and you're how doing. to pray. Yeah. Where and, she's bouncing all over the globe next. Yep. And so um, on that page, um, I will be um, sharing like prayer request and sharing about our partners and how to be able to pray for them. And then I hope to get um, my, my current prayer letter coming out a little bit more regularly. But that part has been uh, a challenge sometimes. Well, it's difficult when you're literally, yeah. I mean, because <clears throat> I think <laughs> you're... And you know you're all over the place yeah. all the time. Yeah. And when Carmen and I c- communicate, sometimes it's through WhatsApp or Signal, or I'll text you, or I mean, you know, yeah. it's like there's yeah. lots of ways. But yeah, and my getting... phone number. Yeah, if you want to text <laughs> me, I'm a much. I'm very fast usually at text. So yeah. my phone number is seven zero four two nine two thirty four zero three. Okay. And I know I know that, you know, there's new people here at West Park as well. So, again, I'm only in Nashville. I'm like two yeah. hours. We try to steal you sometimes. minutes or something. <laughs> I mean, on you're the on the east I was going to say you're on the east yes. side of Nashville. Right. So I'm also completely open to um, coming in and speaking with uh, community groups or um, getting together for coffee or for dinner or whatever um, with individuals. But, yeah, I'm excited about being able to meet some of the new people that I haven't yeah. been able to meet yet. Well, I am encourage people to reach out to you and get to know you better and just watch all the amazing things that God is doing. Um, if they go to your Facebook, do they just search for you, Carmen Hefner? Um, probably it would be best if they could send me an email okay. and just let me know. So I was going to say if that's a want, private group. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. They could search for me as uh, Carmen Hefner on Facebook just to be friends and yeah. then I can add them to okay. the private group. But, so there you go. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you want to share before I wrap us up? Just if you could pray us into Cuba. Oh, um, yeah. If, if you get, if you hear this podcast before I leave for <laughs> Cuba, um, Pray us in. We are taking in um, 50 dozen eggs. Uh, <laughs> I've seen a picture. It's like nothing eggs. I've ever seen. They're freeze-dried eggs. Uh, we're taking in a, a large amount of prescription meds as mm-hmm. well. Um, Julio Fredes, uh, the the Cuban pastor that he works with most specifically in Cuba, is in need of a surgery, so I'm taking mm-hmm. down surgical um, stuff for him. Um, yeah, so, Carmen and I have had a conversation about all the things you can find on Amazon yes. that you never knew. You never knew. You could find or that you needed. You didn't <laughs> know you needed that until you looked for it. So we're taking in about 400 pounds of uh, resources wow. into Cuba. And the most difficult part about Cuba is the airport, both yeah. on as Getting we're entering customs. in, going through customs and Im- immigration, and as we're leaving. So if you could just pray us into Cuba and through the airport with all of our things <sighs> and out of the airport and back home safely. And that's any time you go to Cuba, Absolutely. honestly. Yeah. Well, it's been a joy. Thank a you. A joy to sit down and talk with you. It's been great to be here. And um, I'm sure we'll do this again. Yeah. Or maybe Maybe we'll just do a yearly wrap-up of – where Carmen has been during Where the in year. The world is Carmen. I know. I was. I was gonna say we say that every once in a while. I won't sing the ditty, but everybody knows it, and it's in their head now. Well, thank you again, and um, for those that are listening, I hope that you do reach out to Carmen, and I hope this has been an encouragement to just to see the way that God has worked in her life, and just a reminder of. What he can do if you are faithful. Sometimes when we are called to to reach out to small children and just to bring them to church or to be a part of their life, you never know where that's going to end up and what God has for them through your faithfulness. And that's just one thing that always really sticks out to me about Carmen's story is all of the people that... God has brought into her life, even now. And we all have people in our lives that God has brought, but 
Don't ever discount anything and think, oh, I don't know that it's worth it. But God calls us to be faithful to the people that he has given us to minister to. So Amen. it's exciting. Well, thanks again. And um, if I don't talk to you again, I hope you have a good Christmas. Thank you so much. I hope you do too. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Impact the World. To find out more about West Park Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, visit westparkbaptist.org.